Hi, thanks for joining this talk. My name is Simon Rehm. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge in the group of Professor Max Kraft, and I'm talking about kinetic modeling of electrocatalytic CO2 reduction today. This might seem a bit out of place in the symposium, but I hope at the end of this talk I will have convinced you that it's actually very relevant for a number of reasons and worth looking into for the combustion community as a whole. In order to combat climate change and decarbonize industry, not only net zero, but net negative technologies will be necessary. Efforts to remove carbon from the atmosphere and store or convert it are known as carbon capture utilization and storage, CCUS. When it comes to the CO2 source, direct air capture draws a lot of attention these days. But there's still massive potential using high concentration CO2 waste streams from industry. Moving on, storage, as we can see here, can only be economically feasible via massive subsidies. Utilization, on the other hand, nowadays is mostly enhanced oil recovery, which is also not a sustainable practice. The only real sensible thing is to convert the CO2 to commodity chemicals or fuels, as we can see here. So let's look into an ideal application that would tap into an existing process and convert the CO2 to a chemical that can be used on site or sold easily. The conversion can be done biochemically, thermochemically or electrochemically. The advantage of electrochemistry here is that the reaction can be potentially tuned very precisely via the applied potential or voltage. It has been found that CO2 can be reduced to many different products via copper-based catalysts. So let's look at the actual electrochemical cell that was considered for the study. We only look at the cathode side in detail since that's where the CO2 reduction reaction is taking place. Of course, you also always need an anode with a counter electrode where some oxidation occurs. The electrolyte was a 0.1 molar KHCO3 at almost pH neutral conditions. Gaseous CO2 is constantly bubbled through the electrolyte so as to ensure CO2 saturation. The actual reduction reaction is happening at the working electrode, which is coated with the catalyst material, so copper in our case. Specifically, we are looking at single crystal copper 100 planes. This is so we can use respective DFT results and measurement data for our modeling later. So now a potential is applied to the working electrode versus a reference electrode over here. This drives a reaction and also a current through the system. The current can be measured here, as well as the gaseous and the liquid products, which are sampled at intervals. Specifically, we're looking at the specific production rates or specific current densities of the products after 70 minutes of running this reaction. Let's look at the global reactions taking place at the working electrode. So CO2 molecules are absorbed to the catalyst surface and then protons and electrons are transferred to it. The electrons are supplied by the electrode where a potential is applied. The protons are supplied by the electrolyte. For example, in order to generate ethanol, we would need two CO2s and 12 electron and respective proton transfer steps. Usually, electron and proton transfer occur simultaneously in so-called proton-coupled electron transfer steps. So 12 of these proton-coupled electron transfer steps would be necessary to generate ethanol. The mechanism in which that occurs is largely unknown though. Because we apply potential to a metal-based catalyst in a water-based electrolyte, of course water electrolysis is bound to happen and indeed the hydrogen evolution reaction is competing with the CO2 reduction reaction. The goal is here to keep the so-called Faradayic efficiencies of hydrogen as low as possible compared to the other products in the CO2 reduction reaction. So what are Faradayic efficiencies? Basically they're just a fraction of the current used for a specific product. If 100 electrons are flowing through the system, how many of these electrons are going into, for example, ethanol production? In order to make this process more scalable and economically feasible, selectivities need to be improved drastically. The current approach is basically trial and error, producing different copper electrodes with better or worse for Faraday efficiencies. But there are millions and millions of possible structures, so accurate models are needed. The current state of research in this field only knows two types of models. On the one side here, we have models on the scale of whole reactors and mostly concerned with mass transport and limitations thereof. It can be assessed, for example, how different electrode structures can influence the CO2 availability at the catalyst surface. But for the actual product rates, 
or specific current densities, we have to rely on global surrogates. The butler volmer equation, for example, you can see here, describes the logarithmic relationship between specific current densities and applied potential. The relevant parameters have to be fitted with experimental data. On an atomistic level, ab initio calculations are also being done. This is usually done by hypothesizing a mechanism or a small part of a mechanism and calculating intermediates and transition states by a density functional theory. With this, activation barriers and Gibbs free energy of reaction steps can be calculated. There are two problems with this though. The first problem is that only some of the steps are calculated, which are deemed rate or selectivity determining. We don't know if that's actually the case though. The second problem is that we cannot make quantitative assessments of the production rates just by having a few numbers of the reaction steps. Thermodynamics, kinetics and concentrations of the involved species of all the reaction steps along a pathway have to be taken into account in order to do that. So what I'm trying to do with this work is bridging the gap that we can see here by utilizing microkinetic modeling and other tools that are commonplace in the combustion community. I use kinetic and thermodynamic parameters from DFT calculations to feed to a microkinetic model that then calculates rates of production, which then in turn can be fed into mass transport models if needed. So how do we get a full mechanism if only a few reaction steps are usually reported at a time? We generate a full mechanism based on extensive literature review. It was done semi-automatically from steps that were reported in the literature and it was based on DFT data availability and products reported from measurements. So as you can see here in the CO2 reduction reaction, we have all the adducts and products in green and all the intermediates in black. We have reduction level from top zero, so CO2, to the bottom 12, so we have 12 proton coupled electron transfers down here towards ethanol or ethylene. And we have C1 species on the left and C2 species on the right. On the top right corner, we see also the hydrogen evolution reaction depicted. So based on this, there are three main reaction steps, main reaction types. First of all, reduction steps, proton coupled electron transfer steps. Second of all, coupling steps. So at some point we need to have a dimerization reaction of the C1 intermediate to form the C2 products. And adsorption and desorption steps. So CO2 at the beginning needs to be adsorbed and products in the end need to be desorbed. Isomerization steps and combined steps were considered only with strong indicators or available DFT data. Focus in this work was also on proper differentiation of steps and intermediates that are not often distinguished properly in formal publications. It's extremely important for microkinetic modeling though. For example, different intermediate structures are reported for CO-CO coupling, as you can see here, which is supposed to be the dominating coupling step. And different authors have considered quite different intermediate structures, so we included all of the ones that we had data on. For example, these two that are just basically isomers and these two. Also, the reduction steps are usually considered as proton coupled electron transfers, as I said, but based on proton origin, many different mechanisms for the same reduction step, one proton and one electron are possible. Based on what are the most likely proton origins, we considered three different mechanisms for every single reduction step. The first one where the proton is coming directly from the electrolyte. The second one where the proton is coming from a water molecule in the electrolyte. And the third one where the proton is already adsorbed to the surface as part of the hydrogen evolution reaction where proton is adsorbed to the first surface as a first step. So the actual kinetic modeling then is done as follows. We see an example of a simplified mechanism on the left. We have adsorption, reaction and desorption and the Arrhenius laws for re reaction rates are applied. We have to account for how the original activation barriers though are lowered by applied 
potentials. And this is done by a constant charge transfer coefficient here. So in green, we have all boundary conditions that are applied to the model, for example, applied potential and bulk concentrations. And in red, we have all the parameters that need to be calibrated and the initial values of which are provided by density functional theory. Temperature is assumed constant in this model, which it actually is in electrochemical cells usually. We assume that all reactions happen directly at the solid liquid boundary, where the full applied potential drops from U basically to zero volt. Bulk concentrations at the interface are all considered constant, only coverages on the catalyst surface are allowed to change. And furthermore, we apply the mean field assumption, so there are no spatial gradients within the phases. So now basically four independent types of parameters are needed. We have Gibbs free energies and chemical potentials that determine basically the Gibbs free energies. So chemical potentials for every single species involved that determine Gibbs free energies of reaction for all the reaction steps. Then we have activation barriers, charge transfer coefficients, and pre-exponential factors. For three of them, we can get initial values by DFT, so the charge transfer coefficient, activation barrier, and Gibbs free energy slash chemical potentials. For pre-exponential factors, we rely on stochastical mechanics. All initial values come with intrinsic uncertainties, as you can see here, which we use as ranges in which we allow them to vary for the calibration. So in total, we have 386 parameters that we need to calibrate if you sum all of these up down here. So we calibrated these parameters towards three main objectives. First, we want to be as close to the initial literature DFT results as possible. Second of all, conservation of energy is of course needed. And third, we want to calibrate towards Faraday efficiencies from experiments reported in the literature. For this reason, we break the calibration down into multiple steps to get a better grip on the number of parameters and optimization targets. We have three steps and we always optimize two out of six parameters towards two out of three targets. So for the first step, after the first step, we have the thermodynamics set. So all Gibbs free energies and therefore energy levels of the intermediates. The other steps calibrate kinetic parameters to reproduce the Faraday efficiencies and basically two steps get in the right order of magnitude and then basically fine-tuning via the pre-exponential factors. So these are the results of the fully calibrated model. The crosses and error bars are measurements and their uncertainties from Wang et co-workers and the solid lines are the simulation results of the calibrated microkinetic model. For the major products on this side we get quite a good fit throughout most of the applied potential range and all qualitative trends of production are captured by the model. For the minor products here, we see some larger deviations, but that is mostly to the fact that they are relative to the different scale, only going to 10% here. So now that we have a fully calibrated microkinetic model, we can look at rates of specific reactions as well as surface coverages of specific intermediates. On the right, we have a flux diagram where surface coverages are indicated by a background color of the intermediate, like here on a green to white scale that is shown down here. Fluxes of each step are relative to initial CO2 or hydrogen adsorption and are indicated by arrow color of reactions on the red to yellow scale that is shown down here. Starting at small applied potentials, so minus 0.85 volts, and we indicated also the area on the Faraday efficiency diagram here, most notable is that the complete white of all arrows in the upper right region here. There are no signs of CO coupling, even though we considered all these different possible reaction steps. Instead, we see CHO coupling almost exclusively towards the C2 products, especially ethylene. This is observed despite the large CO coverages. We can see the full green here that are also observed experimentally and have been used as argument for CO coupling as dominating mechanism. So if we increase the potential a bit, a second coupling path becomes active. Down here, direct coupling of CH2 
can also lead to ethylene and both production paths seem to coexist. Looking at the left side of the mechanism, here we can see a few intermediates with large coverages that are not part of any main reaction path. For example, the OCH3 here, the coverage is so large but the kinetics of further steps seem to be so slow that it doesn't do anything, basically. If now we increase apply potential even further, the CH2 coupling becomes finally dominating. Furthermore, we see considerable methane production now. And as we can see over here, methane is now the main CO2 reduction product at this point. And... Um, if we sum up what we have seen now, looking at the reaction rates and the coverages, we can say that we don't see any coupling of CO intermediate, um, even though it has been suggested throughout the literature for a long time. Since some of these hypotheses seem to be based on faulty assumptions, and we have undertaken large efforts to include all possible coupling mechanisms with CO, we are quite confident in these results, though. Luo and co-workers have already suggested two different pathways for ethylene production. One active at smaller potentials and one active at applied potentials a bit larger that coincide with methane production. This high potential methane and ethylene pathway we can actually see it is the CH2 dimerization here. And as we have seen with OCH3, for example, pathways with slow downstream steps can de facto poison the catalyst. And this could be a major mechanism of catalyst aging, which is not understood very well so far. So to sum it all up, mechanism generation and kinetic modeling are applicable to a wide variety of fields, including emerging fields where the experience and the toolkit of the combustion community could be very useful. Also, a fully elementary quantitative CO2 reduction microkinetic model is actually possible and we can get valuable insights on active coupling reactions and also catalyst poisoning. I thank you for your attention. Now if you have any questions, feel free to ask them or also feel free to get in touch with us.